Hey TRT fam, today I want to talk about the strategies you as a patient can do and employ to ensure that the blood work that you get is the most accurate. Oftentimes we aren't told what we should do to ensure that we get the most accurate blood work. A lot of times we're just told, hey, you've been on such and such therapy for X amount of time, get the bloods done. Today, let's talk about how to ensure that your labs are accurate. Mizumi is the number one product for acne problems on TRT. Check out the products using the link in the description under this video. The first area I want to talk about today is thyroid. So without further ado, when you are evaluating for possible thyroid dysfunction, keep in mind it's important to get your hormone levels drawn in the morning. Okay, so if you are somebody that lives on a normal 24 hour circadian rhythm, i.e. you don't work third shift, typically the thyroid hormones would peak in the middle of night. And what literature has shown us is that in normal circadian rhythm pattern patients, it peaks roughly between 2 a.m. and 4 p.m. And then with that diurnal pattern, it tapers off throughout the day and it tapers off typically between 4 p.m. and 8 p.m. Now, these fluctuations, they can change by up to one to two points. Uh, so what that tells us is, say if you have a raw, true morning TSH of 2.5, but you've elected to get your hormones drawn later in the day, it could swing as much as two points. That means it could swing up to 4.5 or vice versa. Now, the problem with that is that these fluctuations, depending on the time of day you got the bloods drawn, it can lead to under treatment of patients who actually need therapy. Now that brings another question. You're probably thinking, why would you want to get it in the morning if that is in fact when the thyroid hormones are the highest? Well, simply answer, that's because sometimes your highest value is still too low. So the next piece of advice when getting your thyroid hormones drawn is to avoid biotin at least 72 hours prior to getting blood work. Especially if you're taking five to 10 milligrams or more a day, it is recommended to give it roughly about a three days cushion between stopping biotin and getting your blood work done. But I've actually read some literature that suggests maybe you should wait upwards of one to two weeks to allow the biotin to wash out. Okay, so here's why. Because in the immunometric assays, which are the typical tests that are, for the most part, used in obtaining TSH labs, the biotin can actually register as a false low, thus making the TSH look more suppressed than it actually is. What this means to you is it can make the value look quote unquote good, when in reality it's actually not as good as you would think. Now, on the contrary, biotin can cause false highs in the competitive binding assays, which are the types of tests that are typically used in obtaining the free T3s, the free T4s, and so on. So in that case, it would make you think that your labs are much better than they actually are. Again, we don't want to have falsely good values when in reality, the patient actually needs treatment. Next on the agenda, I want to talk about how to obtain the most accurate uh, prolactin levels possible. In a previous video, I discussed about the physiology of prolactin and how it has implications into sexual dysfunction, but that's beyond the scope of this video. Now, when obtaining your prolactin levels, initially, you would get them done first thing in the morning and fasted. And reason being is because food, yes, food can actually stimulate a little bit of prolactin, albeit it's, it's rather minute, but if you're trying to get a true, accurate raw number, you want to abide by the principles to obtain that so you know what your number truly is. Also, you want to avoid ejaculating or having any kind of sexual activity, ideally two to three days prior to getting your blood work. Because yes, ejaculation can promote secretion of prolactin. And again, if you want to have accurate levels, you want to make sure you apply the principles to get those accurate levels. Now, nipple stimulation, it can, but again, it's, it's very minute. Uh, typically, if nipple stimulation were to increase prolactin significantly, that would happen in the pregnant person and most likely the TRT patients that would not apply to them. Now, another major cause of high prolactin, which may completely be outside of your control, 
depending on your current health situation, but that would be the antipsychotic medications. And the antipsychotic medications are notorious for increasing prolactin. Now, albeit, they don't typically get prolactin much higher than 25, 50, but Risperdone has actually been known to increase prolactin significantly, hence why it's known for causing gynecomastia and low testosterone. Now, it's interesting the mechanism action of how the site meds affects prolactin. So prolactin and dopamine, they antagonize one another. So dopamine, when dopamine levels go higher, it pushes prolactin levels down and vice versa. Now, the antipsychotics, one of the mechanisms of action of how they work is they antagonize dopamine. So in other words, they, they block dopamine, they suppress your dopamine levels. Well, in the presence of low dopamine, prolactin levels will increase. Now, a few drugs that may be within your power to control, at least briefly before getting uh, prolactin levels drawn, well, one of them would be Reglan, which is uh, an old school gastric motility agent. And another one is methyl dopa, which is an old school drug that's not very commonly used, but it's indicated for treating hypertension. Now, both of those can increase prolactin by, again, uh, suppressing dopamine levels. Additionally, some of the old school growth hormone releasing peptides, those could also increase prolactin, albeit it's, it's very minute and wouldn't really expect it to have any clinically significant effect on the patient. But it's kind of like more as an FYI. Two major conditions that are known to increase prolactin. Uh, one would be chronic renal disease, uh, a new chronic kidney disease. And that increases prolactin via decreased metabolic clearance of prolactin via the kidneys. And the other condition is hypothyroidism. If the hypothyroidism is corrected and treated well and you got your hormones optimized like they should be, that'll correct the prolactinemia, the hyperprolactinemia secondary to hypothyroidism. Again, these, two, these are two major conditions that are known to increase prolactin, but if they are both addressed and treated, uh, then the prolactin will return to its uh, normal values. And the last area I want to talk about that could increase prolactin is stress. So some of the literature shows that it can increase prolactin levels, albeit uh, the higher end that it may get, maybe 30, 40. But you as a patient, if you're trying to get the best, most raw, accurate numbers, things you can do to reduce your stress, obviously good sleep hygiene, meditation, grounding, spirituality, any of those things that you can employ and use on a regular basis to ameliorate your stressful situation, please try to. So again, those are some tactics for getting more accurate prolactin levels. Hope you found these pieces of advice useful when obtaining your thyroid and prolactin values. Until next time, we'll see you.